I graduated in 1992, in December of 1992. And um, I, in my last semester at school, I had taken a, a class in entrepreneurship. And I got together with three friends, one from France and two from Israel. And we created our project. And our project was to create a global and international shopping network where we would provide products um, from different countries, especially for the diaspora of those countries, but for, for anyone, uh, like you could move products all around the world and make them available via this international network. This is 1992. So early. And so we went, we went and, and, so, and we, like, we, we worked on it for about three months and then we all sort of said, like, God, putting, how do you even think about putting together the infrastructure for this thing? Like, we, we just like, it was like, the, and it was totally a, a, an, an entrepreneurial failure on our part because we didn't probably try hard enough. But we all like went off and because there wasn't there wasn't really anything there. The I knew a lot about that the internet exists, but like you know, thinking just thinking about getting that internet to consumers so they could buy things, it like it was it was starting to happen. But there were these there were these little islands of CompuServe and Prodigy and an AOL starting, but it was, it was, it just seemed impossible. The timing wasn't quite right. But that being said, the year before Tim Berners-Lee had created HTTP. And, and so we gave up and, you know, and, and I look back and I'm like, what, you know, Amazon was around the corner, right? It was mm. about to happen. So it was really interesting. It really interesting for me to look back. And then, and then of course, when I, I mean, I've been, I've been, thinking about a worldwide network for a long time, not because I was particularly far-seeing. It's because I read science fiction. <laughs> and, and people like John Bruner and, and others had written about networks. Actually, an interesting aside, if you're interested. John Bruner wrote this book called Shockwave Rider. And I read that in the... Um, I think late 70s when I was in college. And um, it talked about this net and it, it, it was, it was, you know, it was, you might guess, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it was, it was connected, it was, it was connected to future shock and, and, the, and the advance of technology. But there were two concepts that were really important. One, and connected to me in interesting ways. One is this concept of a, of a net, right? A world net that anyone can connect to, which stuck with me forever, right? And, 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 of course, was very far seeing because 30 years later, 40 years later, here we are. But interestingly, he also invented the concept of the computer worm. And a computer worm, right, is that virus that goes from machine to machine. And it just turns out that the founder of Y Combinator, where I work now <laughs> as a partner, Robert Morris, invented the first real computer worm and unleashed it pseudo-accidentally on the world um, in, the, um, in the late 80s and actually got in a lot of trouble for it as well. Um, so that book has kept on coming back and that, those concepts have kept on coming back to me. Um, so a lot of, it's interesting, a lot of people foresaw what was going on, but it took a few key innovations. Um, it, it took, it, it took a, there was, you know, if you look at history and you look at the confluence of events that come together to create sort of the great event, World War II, you know, the invention of the internet, Man, Manhattan Project, the invention of the internet, things like that, the, the, the creation of the World Wide Web and, and the connected world as we know it today had to have a bunch of things come together at the right time. And it was, it was a really fascinating time for me. I remember, we're not rolling yet, are we? We Actually, are. We are. Okay. We are. Okay. So, well, I don't know if this is useful to you, but... It's great. Um, I, I remember. So here, my, my my quick individual story, if you're interested. About I was actually, that's where I'd like to start is you're kind of laying this framework of this confluence of events, this sort of combustible time that created right. a spark that changed the world. So let's tie in your so, your story to that. So I I tried to start this worldwide shopping network with my with my um, fellow students from this business school in, in Europe, 
and we failed. And I, I wasn't feeling very good about that. And I came back to the United States, not really feeling very, very good about anything because I was an engineer. I was a coder. And I went to get a business degree because I really liked business. I liked that. And I wanted to start a company. I'd always wanted to start a company. I'd been thinking about starting a company forever and hadn't done it for, for like a decade because I, I went back to school twice and I got good opportunities to go abroad and I didn't do it. And I, I kind of went back to the United States with my tail between my legs and went back to work at HP. And, and of all things, a business development job. And, and of all things, network management, which I hated. And, you know, it was a very frustrating, kind of unhappy time in my life. And then an old friend of mine, I can remember this like it was yesterday, although it was, it was um, 21 years ago now. Um, it was 19, it was, it was 1993, 93. An old friend called me, called me up and we were just talking about like catching up because I had been overseas for five years and we hadn't really seen that much of each other. And he said, Oh, by the way, have you seen Mosaic? And I said, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. What is it? And he said, I'm not really sure, but it's like it allows you to look at the network. And I said, you mean like a protocol analyzer? Um, and he said, no, not like that. But you have to check it out. And I was like, okay, whatever. And it turns out that getting Mosaic, which you know was the browser that Mark Andreessen created at, 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 um, at Indiana was that, um, at Illinois, was that um, the interesting thing about Mosaic that was, that was kind of unique and different was that for the first time it took text and images and put them together. And that was one thing. And the second thing that was really interesting about Mosaic, especially in light of what's happened since then, is what is that they distribute it completely for free. Here it is, take it. Freeware, shareware. And so it was not that bad, hard to get it. I found it and downloaded it, but it was actually pretty hard to get it to work because I was working inside a corporation and you couldn't connect to the outside world. You had to set up this, this crazy proxy server and you had to do a bunch of stuff. But in, in a week or two, I set it up and all of a sudden, I was, I was sort of stunned. I quit my job. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think I quit it the next week. I said, this is it. I'm doing, this is finally it. And um, and then proceeded to make every possible mistake you can make as a, as a, a startup founder who really doesn't know a lot about what you're going to do. I, my, my boss at the time at HP looked at me and said, what are you doing? Don't, like, if you want to go do something, but don't, don't leave without an idea. Don't, like, don't just go. You're crazy. And I was, I was like, but yeah, but this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. It's it, I'm sure. And that was an interesting, like, I think you had to be a true believer then because, you know, I, I remember I was, I would be driving around Palo Alto with my then girlfriend, now wife. And, and, and you know, this is like 93, 94. And every once in a while, you'd drive past a sign and there would be a URL on it. And I would put, look, it's real. This isn't just like, and, you know, she would just say, yeah, whatever. Sure it is. Because <laughs> you didn't like, you know, it's hard to imagine back then. But, you know, it's like, it's like, Margaret, we were talking earlier about what, Aunt, that, what Gordon Moore was saying. I was like, uh, you know, it just seemed like a nice little networking thing. People are going to put it together. And, it's, you know, who knows? Um, but um, there was a series of events, a series of events, and, and it wasn't that long before we were buying our first filer, talking <laughs> about NetApp, to build a web-based, web-based email product that, um, that ended up being the reason why 401 was purchased by Yahoo, although we were originally created as a directory service. Mike had mentioned that, like, the interesting the interesting thing for him about everything that's been created is the way it creates human be it, way it connects human beings. When we talk about the connected world, we do sort of talk about companies connected to companies or, or um, products connected to reviews, some kind of, some atom connected to some atom or some concept connected to some concept. But of course, in the end, what we're really talking about is connecting people with people. And we, we, we saw that. We said, what if we created a way for people to more easily 
connect to people, create a directory of people so they could find people in ways that they could never find them before. Um, remember back then, we had, we had these big books that got delivered by the phone company. Remember that? They would drop them off, boom, for free too, right? Boom, here's your phone book. And that was like, you know, the phone books. Still, like, that, that, that only line. The local, only the local one. Only the right? local ones. Had to go to the, the yellow pages, too. The yellow pages. Remember the yellow pages? But big, like, and I still remember that great line from the Steve Martin movie, The Jerk. You know, the new phone books are in the new phone books. Remember that? And, like, that just seems so long ago. Like, who would do that? But we said, well, we said, that seems anachronistic. Let's, let's help people connect with people. But, of course, that's not really where it was at. Where it was at was connecting people in a slightly deeper way, which was with email, which, of course had been around since the 70s. But with the creation of Rocket Mail, which is what created Forum One, and the creation of Hotmail, um, and Yahoo Mail got bought by, uh, Rocket Mail got bought by Yahoo, Hotmail got, got bought by Microsoft, um, suddenly email went from a curiosity and then this corporate thing that was used internally and then somewhat separately and then in pockets it, you know, Prodigy Mail and AOL Mail, it went to being universal. And that was, I think, from uh, certainly from a communications standpoint, one of the real fundamental shifts that happened back in those days. And, and, um, and the thing about NetApp, which was really interesting, is that NetApp, I think they were public when we started talking to them. I think they went public about that time. They were still a startup. And it felt like everyone was, everyone was, was, we used to talk at Yahoo about the fact that, uh, you know, it was hard to actually get vendors for almost anything because we were paving the road as we were going. It was, and where the road was going wasn't so clear. We just knew it was going and it was going, and it was going fast, you know, because the latent demand for sharing and for, con for connections was unbelievable. I, I, I just, the, the, um. I mean, it's hard to imagine at this time, but because you see Facebook and there's a billion users. But at the time, you know, we used to say with amazement, "Oh my God, a stadium full of people came in and signed up for Yahoo Mail today." You know, and then two stadiums. I mean, it went from like, "Oh my God, a thousand people came" to ten thousand. And like, like when was it going to stop to twenty thousand, to fifty thousand, to a hundred thousand, to a million every day? Like literally in a day, a million people would come. And we've seen that again and again, and we will see that again and again. There, I still maintain that there will be services that's, that pop up with it, that within a week will have a billion people sign up because that's how quickly, that's how tightly connected we are, and that's how quickly ideas and memes spread around the world today. So let's go back to that moment where you're talking about this, you're paving the road as you're, 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 you're creating it, you don't know where it's going. What were some of the sort of hardest challenges that you were facing at that time. And we sort of have the advantage of 2020 hindsight, but what were some of the technical, organizational, business, you know, connecting to market challenges at that time and, and um, that you think were sort of essential for you to figure out that then enabled you to move forward? Hmm. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, the challenges were legion, right? Everything. It's interesting. Everything was hard. Everything. Um, it's 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 hard to it's hard to choose where to start. It, and at the same time, we were incredibly lucky. It wasn't that hard because because we were in the middle of this secular growth that that was that was, in a sense, inevitable. And so all you had to do was was grab on and manage not to let go. And just to hold on as long as you can a, 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 until something happened because it was going to happen. But it wasn't so easy to hang on. And it wasn't so easy to hang on for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, there was a lot of skepticism. A lot of skepticism. Even as the bubble expanded, no one believed. <laughs> it was like, come on, really? These things aren't that Like, come on. It's just like, whatever. You're like a direct. Yahoo, you're like a direct. Like, how can this be valuable? What, what is, like, so you give me everything away for free. How can, like, you can't make that up in volume. It's not, you know, it's not going to work. It's, and, you know, um, at, at, y, at Y Combinator and Magic K12, the two accelerators we, we work at now, people ask us all the time, well, where should I base my company? And we say, well, you know, wherever, you, wherever you're, 
you want where your network's the strongest. However, we'll say this. If you, one of the real advantages of, of starting a company in Silicon Valley is when you go to the supermarket and you bump into someone, you say, oh, hi, and they say, what are you doing now? And you say, you're doing a startup. You're more likely to get, oh my gosh, that's cool, or so am I, it's awesome. Whereas, if you go to certain parts of the world where it's not perceived in the same light, and you bump into someone and, and, and you say you're at a startup, they say, well, why, why would you do that? Shouldn't you get a job? And that wears on you. And in the early days, what we were doing, we ran into that all the time. Like, what are you doing? Why don't you get, like, why don't you work on something real? Enterprise software. <laughs> I don't know. You know, databases, um, go, go, har boxes, hardware. At least that's what NetApp was doing, right? Now, NetApp was catching a very different wave, in a sense, and I think it's interesting. Good, let's talk about that, your perspective on NetApp. Um, but, well, I, I think to, let me come back to that, okay. because I think the idea of challenges, because that led to another major challenge, which is the fundamental challenge for every startup that they, you run into first and have to solve, which is how do you get talent? So how do you describe to people when you're at a, like a, a little puny company like 4 and one and say, we're creating the directory of the future, or we're creating a web-based email product. And how do you convince great engineers to come, great anyone, to come and work for you? It's hard. You have to spin a tail, and they have to buy into it. And so, um, luckily, you know, I think there are, there are other people like me who had, you know, read, I don't know, read science fiction and believed in this, believed in the possibility, or we were, we were able to articulate sort of a dream of what this meant once you connect all these things. But I, I, that, that was hard. And then, and then financing. Before the bubble especially, um, venture capitalists were leery <laughs> of financing these things. Now, of course, that changed very quickly. You know, um, if venture capitalists are nothing else but not quite clear-headed in seeing when app, when opportunity strikes, and they saw it, they saw it hard, and you know some of them made a lot of money because of that. Others didn't when the bubble burst, and it was painful, but it was it was um, it was difficult in those very very early years. It was difficult. Um, uh, what are the fundamental? Oh, we were talking about Gordon Moore. I mean, Gordon Moore's law was in effect in so many ways as, as this revolution happened. The computers were getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every, every year. And your ability to serve pages very cheaply and to store data more and more cheaply um, was so obvious that we kind of missed it. <laughs> it was so obvious. You know, um, uh, so there, there was, there is this extraordinary change in the way we think about how we store data and how we access data and what that data is for. That NetApp was, at, you know, was sort of right at the very, very beginning of where there was this explosion in the need to store data to access data. They, they were at the beginning of the. Uh, like before people talked about big data, that was what they were doing, right? They were, they said, you need access to all your data all the time. You know, big data goes, it, it, big data, I think the evolution of that is that that's now plumbing. And now that we have all that data, and we think we can keep on storing it because, you know, we, we went from a single disk being a gigabyte to a terabyte, which is like a thousandfold in not that much time, right? To, uh, our first filer, by the way, I believe was 50 gigabytes. And the first file that we, that was the first one we started testing with. And the first file that we launched with was an F540, maybe? Might have been, it might, I might have the number wrong, but it, it was 200 gigabytes. Not 200 gigabytes usable, but because there was a bunch of OS stuff. Um, it was probably more like um, 170 or 180 or something like that. There are users of Yahoo Mail today who use more data than that first single file. And by the way, our goal was, I can't remember exactly how close we got to this goal, but our goal was to have 500,000 users be able to use that first file. All right. Um, so they were at the very beginning of this explosion, this incredible 
change in the way that data is thought about and stored. I, I'm, th those are the days when you, like, you throw stuff away. Like, who cares? You just throw it away, right? And then, and um, fundamentally, accessing your data reliably, rapidly, became fundamental to almost everything we do now. Whether it's your banking data when you log into your bank, or, or your, your order history on Amazon, um, or their data, which is the, the products and the product changes that they show you every day, became so fundamental. And, and, and pretty clearly, NetApp hit that right on, and they grew incredibly quickly because of that. It, it, in fact, it's interesting. If you look at the growth of NetApp revenues and Yahoo revenues, I think they, they, they almost exactly parallel one another, including in 2000. They came down together, too. Interesting. Huh? So that partnership or that relationship between NetApp and Yahoo is interesting. At least two rapidly growing companies, sort of meteoric growth, doubling every year, yeah. and then this. It, and it, then people it, at NetApp kind of credit partners for helping sort of evolve the business model. Oh yeah, and it and, right? it, so and it hurt. So it, tell us if it hurt know, a lot. Share like that from your perspective. How did how did that relationship work from your perspective, and how did it evolve? We um, and it was sort of what tech what sort of real product or business implications flew, you know, came out of that relationship? We, um, we had a pretty tight relationship with, with NetApp in a variety of ways. I think we had three connections into NetApp. Dan Wormenhoven was my ex-boss at HP. Um, Dave Hitz was a friend of, of Dave Nakayama. And I'm pretty sure Larry Drebus, one of the co-founders of 4in1, had, had, knew one of the engineers at, one of the, the, the um, key engineers on the NetApp team. So, like, we, we were buddies. We knew, we knew, we knew NetApp. And when, when we came into, like, when we thought about our architecture, it was pretty clear to us. We, you know, NFS, the thing about NFS you have to understand is it's, um, it's sort of, it pushes any worries about storage away because, you, like, you sort of know how to access files. It just, it makes it simple. So it's a nice shortcut. It's transparent and it's easy. And we didn't really want to worry about that. That's sort of the idea, right? Is, is that it's, if you think about like you create an API where we'll, work, we'll, we'll take that, you, you guys deal with like the mail part because the storage part isn't really part of the mail part. Um, so for better or worse, Google took a very different um, approach with Gmail. Again, for better or worse. But we said what we could focus on is is um, we were we were a tiny company at the time we were like 25 to 30 people and we needed to uh, and uh, you know and mail itself was a fairly complex beast to build so we needed to be able to take storage off the table and that's what we hoped NetApp would do and that philosophy continued um, Yahoo um, started a relationship with NetApp um, for an equally critical part of the Yahoo infrastructure, which was our user database, where we stored the the, the registration in, information for each user who 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 joined Yahoo, and um, and that grew. But of course, mail, in the end, dominated the relationship, and. I, I like to think that um, that the pain we went through was good for both companies, but the pain we went through was that no one could have imagined how mail would grow and the performance demand that it would put on uh, on the storage device and the um, growth demands that it would put on the device. And frankly, filers were not ready for that. We weren't ready for it for a variety of reasons. but. Um, the good news is we had a tight relationship, and so it became tense because, you know, there was there were many many sleepless nights where filers would break, and when a filer broke, it was it was you 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 know, you know, we all carried pagers all the time, and at, at that time I was running a group in engineering at, at Yahoo, which had mail amongst other things and when mail broke when users couldn't get at their email I, we were up all night and we were waiting for a for a for the NetApp to essentially rebuild its file system 
to you know put new disks in if that was a problem, if there was a bug, to try to recover. No, the um, almost amazing news is we, we, I talked to some of the guys. We can't really remember ever losing data because of a, a NetApp. We, we actually lost data way in the early days because of because of engineering mistakes, but almost never because of NetApp. But we lost a lot of time and suffered a lot of pain. So did NetApp, <laughs> and we had some hard meetings. Um, where we're like, you know, if either this device works for us or we have to go off separately. And um, I, I think it, uh, and uh, you know, to Dan's credit, I mean, we, we had a hard meetings with Dan, like, you know, CEO, come on in and sit down and say, okay, this is, this is bad. <laughs> I'm tired <laughs> and, you know, your shit doesn't work. And it's got to. And um, and we had a long relationship at the time as this was happening. This you know these are sort of in the 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 first couple of years of the growth of Yahoo Mail as it started to go like, like this and then like this and all of a sudden we were you know ordering filers once a week. <laughs> you know it began you'd order them once every two or three months and then you know and and you know pretty soon we're like it was essentially a, a daily deployment of a of a new filer. And um, and I, I think that forced. NetApp to rethink a lot about how it built its filers, how it QA'd them, how it supported them, how the entire infrastructure worked. If they were going to be, a, you know, they, you, you, you're, when a customer is driving you to a limit, you have to ask yourself, okay, is this typical? Is this is? Do we need to build a device that responds to this? Is this the space we're in? And, and they very clearly said yes. So we need to be able to take our filers from, you know, 99% reliability. To 99.9 and 99.99 percent reliability. How do we build a, an organization that can do that? I think they had to completely rethink how they did that. And you know, within a couple of years, we were we were a huge customer. Uh, uh, you know, they we went from being an important customer to one of the two biggest customers because it worked. Um, and there was a lot of innovation that that had to do with. I didn't see all of it clearly, but business processes inside of NetApps to, because if you think about what you have to do to get that kind of reliability, it's actually hard. It's how, you actually have to have to rethink how you build and how you ship product to actually make that work. You have to think about how problems that come in, how that how that gets connected to engineering and how engineering responds and how you think about when you're building something, what kind of tolerances you have. When you test something, what kind of tolerances do you have? How do you get it so that it can run for a year with no problem, right? Um, and and uh, and my perspective for is that, that that was incredibly valuable to NetApp, because once you get there, then you can you, you, the, a whole series of applications opens to you that wouldn't have been open otherwise, and um, and actually could have brought reduced the size of the company or even brought it down much more quickly. I think that was uh, you know compared. Uh, I, I don't think their the NetApp competition aspects and the rest had that sort of advantage. It's so interesting to hear this relationship in those early days. I'd like to pull back, kind of move up to 10,000 foot level and mm -hmm. think about Yahoo and, and NetApp in the Silicon, in Silicon Valley and sort of the larger ecosystem. And would you describe sort of what were the attributes of Silicon Valley at that time, this rapid growth time? And then kind of fast forward now to your role and Y Combinator and others as we're seeing a different kind of ecosystem, building different kinds of companies. Can you kind of lay that perspective out over the evolution of the last years? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that. I, I fear that, you know, we were kind of in the middle of a tornado. It's a, the old term for when you're in a crazy growth business. And um, it's hard to see outside of a tornado. <laughs> and interestingly for me, I, I, I kind of, I kind of left the entrepreneurial world that I've been in the middle of for about four years, from 93 to 97, when we got bought by Yahoo. And because it was this amazing thing, a amazing place to be, I stayed there and, and didn't get back into startups for another nine years. Um, 
So I don't know that I have the best perspective on that, but I will say that in an interesting way, the time right around the sort of the craziness when John Doerr talked about, you know, he was John who talked about the, the greatest creation of wealth ever seen. Because there was this incredible disruptive change. And there were so many people saw it. All of a sudden, there there was this change in behavior where people went away from comfortable long-term jobs at places like HP um, or Goldman Sachs <laughs> or McKinsey, whether it was some business school or engineering school, and came and started companies because, because it was clearly the beginning of something so big. And in a sense, for a little while, Silicon Valley, where, you know, it used to be what you would do is you would work for four to ten years, get your experience, and then go start your company and, and you know, submit a business plan to the guys on Sand Hill Road, the guys in, in suits up <laughs> on Sand Hill Road. And you'd get dressed up in a suit, and you'd go and you'd pitch your thing, and and... And if you had good experience, a good tracker, usually selling enterprise software, because that's mostly what software was. There wasn't that much of financing of consumer products, games and the like, a little bit, but not that much. Then you might get a first round of funding in exchange for 40% of your company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that, you know, there was this, this, this fusion of founders, younger and younger, right, that that kind of stopped for a while. There was this, the Silicon Valley kind of exploded and then kind of contracted in the bursting of the bubble in 2000. And, and, and we, it kind of sort of went back a few years and getting a real job in 2000 started to look a lot more attractive to people. Um, but I think there was an unstoppable change, right? There was, there was something fundamental that had changed in how you think about your career and how you think about um, the opportunities that are available to you. And I think that's what's sort of coming back in the Valley now. And I, so for, in some ways, it, in, it doesn't, doesn't feel like a bubble to me now. I don't think that's what's going on. I think there's a new perspective in how younger and younger people see the opportunities for them in their careers and the value in being in a a, a younger company, an earlier company, whether they start it themselves or they work for a startup or work for a, a newer company, and the impact they can have, the the fun they can have, the um, the education they can get, and that's like it's interesting for me. It's kind of a there was this big burst of that, and it really sort of changed the way everyone looked at how they do things. Venture capitalists were funding things on a meeting. Oh, wow, you know, you're the globe, you're writing websites, that must be good, here's a million dollars or two million dollars, go. And then, you know, what do you know, they went IPO and you made a lot of money and if you got out of the stock fast, right? But, but it changed the way they thought of the world and the opportunities in front of them, they being investors. And, um, and it changed the way a lot of kids, who aren't kids now, right? Those, those people now are the, are the people who are, who are bigger companies. But new kids coming in sort of see that again and see this, this really long-term opportunity in change and disruption that's continued, right? There's still immense change and disruption happening all the time. And that creates opportunities for new innovation and new startups. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but for me, the, 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 what's more interesting is the parallel between the change that happened then and the, and the more, I think, durable, sustainable change that's happening now in, in, in the world of startups. So I really like the way that you're sort of drawing on your experience and pulling out parallels. If you were to distill down, maybe you do this on a daily basis as you're working with young entre entrepreneurs, sort of lessons from history, whether it's from uh, your personal experience, companies you work for in the past, whether it have been patterns or whatever, if you were to distill some of those lessons that you think are important to pull from, from past companies or from past hmm. environment, what are some of those that you would feel are vital and important for, for current entrepreneurs to understand for going forward? I think what's hard for me is to 
distinguish between lessons I've learned working with the several hundred companies I've worked with over the last four years versus lessons from back then. At, one well, thing, from any, any time period. It can be recent or, you know. One then. thing, um, one thing I always tell kids when I talk to them, I go to talk to a school, is uh, I say don't do what I did. <laughs> I, I went and worked at a, I worked for the man for 10 years before I started my first company. And, and I say, are you kidding me? You know, from 22 to your early 30s is your most creative, energetic, productive time in your life, unencumbered time generally in your life. Why would you spend all that energy, that, that, that ability to learn and grow Working for the man. Do it for yourself or do it in a place where you can have maximum impact. Have maximum impact on yourself and on the world and do it now. And I say, that's what you should do now. Now, that doesn't mean you have to start a company because there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a corollary, which, which is, and I learned this hard when I did this, is that startups are so difficult. They're so, oh, it's, you know, I talk to guys all the time. I, you know, who are, who are in this, you know, whether you've managed to raise a lot of money and then well, you're trying to get customers, you're trying to figure out how you're ever going to survive still, or you're just trying to raise money, or you're just trying to get your act together and find some kind of customer for the product that you think is going to be awesome, but you haven't quite gotten there. It's hard at every step, and there's, there's this immense, crazy roller coaster that you're on. And that's not necessarily for everybody, especially as the founder. Um, some of that is you know you're a little insulated from that if you're an employee but you're still there but it's really hard and it takes it takes sort of a grim determination <laughs> to survive that but you know Paul Graham has this thing that he famously said which which I kind of paraphrase earlier that back then we were in this immense ch period of change and growth you know one of the things I always pointed out to people, when the bubble burst in 2000, the thing that didn't change was the number of people using services, like Yahoo was offering. Like, it wasn't like, you know, stock prices went like that. Use of Yahoo Mail, like that. It didn't change. That fundamental shift that we talked earlier about, that inflection point, was never going to stop. So all you had to do was grip on tight and Hold on, and, and Paul, Paul has said you have two choices when you're when you have a startup. You can either quit or get rich, and that's just a shorthand to say that that um, if you survive, <laughs> if you can keep on going, you'll find success. It's a big if because it's hard, and because sometimes you can't. For sometimes you run out of gas. Um, although it's not always clear when you run out of gas, right? Like when, when exactly are you done in a startup? I used to like to ask people, so when does a startup die? When does a startup die? Well, one answer a lot of people give is well, when you run out of money. But that's not true. There's lots of time, there's lots of cases. I mean, Elon Musk was $400 million in debt with Tesla <laughs> and had little hope of ever getting it back. That's not out of money. That's like that's well beyond even imagining that and some you know that <laughs> didn't die there are so many cases of 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 people who struggle on it's really uh, companies die when founders give up <laughs> and that's really the only answer i can ever think of jeff i wish we had all morning to talk thank you so much i've really appreciated your insights into your own experience what led you to critical decisions as well as your perspective on the evolution of both the technology and this place. Thank well, thanks, you. Thanks, Marguerite. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks.